Dear friends, partners, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Abakhon Sultan Nazarov. I'm the regional director of IWPR in Central Asia. It's my pleasure to open this international expert meeting devoted to the uneasy problem of the Gona Badakhshan Autonomous Region. I'm so happy to see here uh, many familiar faces among the audience today, and we at IWPR are extremely excited to the interest uh, in the topic is growing. The multitude of challenges that will be covered by our speakers during today's event present an important foundation for a better understanding of this neglected topic. Of course, it must be noted that the panel is happening at a tough time when our neighbors are at war with each other, which is another tragic development in our post-Soviet region is experiencing. Witnessing open bloodshed in the 21st century is really heartbreaking. I do hope for a speedy recovery of both sides and wish for both states to find a peaceful solution to the problem. Uh, unfortunately, a similar state of affairs, less in a scale through, is seen in the Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous uh, Oblast. The last several months for GBO have been especially arduous when the region has experienced aggression and massive information attacks, including through spreading fake news, internet cuts, information, and economic blockade, all against the background of sweeping apathy among GBO citizens. They are in disparate search of justice against the arbitrary actions of those in power. So coming to, the, to today's topic, we are attempting to propose solutions for peace building and peacekeeping to preserve stability in the region and to find feasible policies that would tackle existing problems more effectively. Things like mediation, people-to-people -people contacts are really important components to bring the complex sides closer to a consensus. We do hope to find working models to address the region's problem more comprehensively. So in this, on this note, let me introduce uh, today's speakers. We are extremely honored to see our experts who kindly agreed to provide the analysis of the recent developments in the region and present their vision as to where we are going. Professor Dr. Tim Eppkenhens from the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg on the margins of the Silk Road, GBO and changing regional trajectories. Ms. Supya maston Shoiva, an independent analyst will cover sustained denial of human rights as causes of constant instabilities in GBO. Our dear friend, Dr. Paris Mulajana, will speak about roadmap for a peaceful recovery from the crisis in GBO, international experience, main provisions, and recommendations. And Bruce Panner, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, will talk about internal problems of the region, economy, and infrastructure. Of course, I'm also extremely thankful to our partner and a longtime friend, associate researcher from Chat. House, Miss Annette Ball, who is moderating our event tonight. And lastly, this virtual expert meeting is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia project funded by the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I see in the, uh, Mr. Ambassador Christet among the audience tonight. We are thankful to the Norwegian MFA for being our long-term donor and partner. We are very happy to be holding this event today and look forward to having more events with our esteemed partner in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And now let me turn the floor over to today's event chair and moderator, Aneta Bor. Aneta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Abahan. Again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this event brought to you by IWPR. It's fantastic to have you with us. My name is Annette Bohr, and I'm an associate fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, known as Chatham House in London. And I'll be moderating the event today. Ever since the end of the civil war in 1997, the Gona Autonomous Oblast has been the only region in Tajikistan that has not given in to pressure from Dushanbe. Recently, authorities have initiated what is perhaps the most serious crackdown yet on Gabao's informal leaders and influential figures, 
in part by putting the leaders in a row and going after them all at once. Within the space of several weeks, three prominent figures from Gabao were charged with inciting ethnic hatred and other crimes. Not least, the internet has remained switched off since November to prevent news from the region from reaching the world. And a blacklist exists with the names of over 100 people who cannot leave the country. As Abu Khan has noted, we have four excellent presenters today from various parts of the globe to delve into these issues. We'll start with Professor Dr. Tim Epkenhans, who will set the scene for us with some remarks on Gabao and its changing regional trajectories. Now, Tim is Dean of Studies at the Philosophical Faculty at the Albert Ludwigs Universität Freiburg in Germany. And he's carried out research on Islamic elites in post-Soviet Tajikistan, in addition to his work on modern Iranian history and Islam and regional identities in Soviet and post-Soviet Central Asia. Tim has also served as the director of the OSCE Academy in Bishkek. We'll follow Tim with Sukhia Masinshoeva, who is in Geneva and is an independent expert who has worked with UNFPA, OSCE, the Aga Khan Foundation Canada, and International Alert. Her areas of expertise include gender programming and specifically focusing on prevention and response to different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, women's economic empowerment, reproductive health and human rights. Supiya will provide comments on the sustained denial of human rights as causes of constant instability in Gabao. Next, joining us from Prague, we'll hear from Bruce Panier, who is truly a veteran journalist and correspondent who's been covering Central Asia for years and who currently writes Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty's blog, Kishlok Avasi. Bruce is also a well-known voice for observers of Central Asia through his appearances on RFERL's Majlis podcast. Bruce will talk about the historical implications and the current challenges surrounding the tensions in Gabal. And our last speaker is Parviz Mulajanov based in Dushanbe, who is a well-known Tajik political scientist, orientalist, and independent researcher. He earned a doctoral degree in Islamic studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland, and is a graduate of the Department of Oriental Studies at Tajik National University. He's worked with various international organizations and agencies, such as Human Rights Watch Helsinki, UNCHR, UNDP, and ADB. He's the author of over 40 research articles and publications. Parviz will focus his remarks on a potential roadmap for a peaceful recovery from the crisis in Gabao. So welcome, Tim, Sufia, Bruce, and Parviz, and thank you for agreeing to join us today to share your thoughts. Each of our speakers will present for about 10 minutes after which I'll open up the session for Q&A. So please do type in your questions using the chat function. This event is being held on the record and is being recorded for IWPR's YouTube channel. There are occasional snapshots too. So in case you're not comfortable with that, you may turn off your cameras, of course, but we really would appreciate it if you would leave them on so that we can see each other just a little bit more intimate that way. For our Russian speaking audience, simultaneous interpretation is available from English into Russian. Connect to the Russian audio track by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of Zoom and selecting the Russian language while turning off the sound in the original. Lastly, please address all of your queries in the chat box to IWPR staff. With that, Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Annette, for this warm welcome. Also to you, Abachon. Thank you, Natasha Kuriziot, Gorbone Shomor, and Sergei IWPR for inviting me, for having me here. It's really a pleasure. And I'm a little bit nervous because um, when I finally got the invitation and the title of the um, of today's um, like um, conference here, I need to now check whether you see my I was working. Now you should see my presentation. I have a few slides for you. Um, so when it uh, when it was announced, what was the uh, today's um, um, meeting about? The totality of problems. I was a little bit, um, well, I got nervous, and I thought uh, we would spend perhaps a couple of days now together, which would also be my pleasure uh, to talk about Gabao and uh, the many problems we face there, the challenges, and of course the particular tra 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 trajectories. Sergei asked me when we talked about today's meeting that I should talk a little bit about um, the regional 
setting. And I chose to look at some issues I found important for understanding also today's situation in Khorok and in other parts of um, mountainous uh, Badakhshan. So I will talk about on the margins of the Silk Road, Gabao and changing um, regional trajectories. And I have by and large structured my uh, short intervention for this um, evening, uh, afternoon here in Germany into four parts. Um, there is, of course, a question where to locate Gabao, not only uh, on a map, but in this regional and global um, context um, of, in particular, the post-Soviet space and an increasingly um, self-confident China, expanding not only to Central Asia, but also to other regions under the label of the Silk uh, Road point, uh, 2.0 or the so-called um, One Road, One Belt um, uh, initiative, and I will talk about this as well. Um, so these four parts are um, basically the structure of my short intervention for uh, this afternoon. First of all, there is this question where to locate Gebau. Is it heartland? And I will refer to heartland in a few seconds. Or is it periphery? When we uh, adopt an emic perception by the population of Gono Badashan, of mountainous Badashan, itself, we find very often uh, this perception that actually Badakhshan is somehow a central uh, locality also in the context of globalization. I found this advertisement in, I think it was 2004, 2005, traveling um, to Khorok as well, where uh, people were celebrating 80 years since the um, Soviet, or like early Soviet establishment of the autonomous region, where you see then this, this little picture with the roads and this crossing and trucks going in every direction, that actually in a very emic perception, you have an ambivalent by the end of the day, perception of where to locate a Gabao, which is very much also, of course, in, in, in the central hub within Central Asia. The etic perception, so by those who look from the outside, on mountainous Badakhshan, you have a slightly different one that is very often marked by a certain exotization. So it's somewhere in the mountains, in the high mountains, in the Pamir. It's very much a narrative of periphery and not of center, and a narrative of, um, to call it with, with, with um, a German historian from the 19th century, an empty space which is of course from an emic perspective, so from the perspective of the population, the communities in Gabao, not the right way how to see the region as such. But there is a certain ambivalence, and this ambivalence is also partly reflected when we look at how communities consider themselves and how do they identify themselves. A very good, in my opinion, to mirror this ambivalent idea about where to place Gono Badashan in a larger regional context, is the reference here to the Ismaili community, to the Nizari Ismaili community um, and their followers in the Gono Badashan region and not only there, which is on the one hand, a truly transnational religious community with their spiritual leader, the Arahan, currently residing in Europe or the large communities in South Asia and Southeast Asia, in the African continent, in North America, in Europe. So a truly trans-regional and transnational religious community with ties all over the world. But at the other time, or like on the other hand, you have a very kind of also idea and narrative of remoteness and of isolation that derives from the fact that, of course, the uh, today's Ismaili community in the Badashan uh, region uh, has a certain history that is, of course, also related to the exclusion of the Ismaili from the majority Muslim communities elsewhere. And there, to some extent, also migration to that region, which is considered to be remote, mountainous, and therefore not so easy to reach. And of course, also the Ismaili community has experienced throughout history a strong uh, or strong forms of persecution and religious intolerance. And that is also a reason why the Ismaili community is today in Badakhshan. So you have an ambivalence. On the one hand, there's this idea about transnationality, about large networks, and there's this experience and also the narrative of remoteness, of a certain kind of isolation, and not necessarily of centrality of the Gono Badakhshan region. After 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and particularly also the rise of China in the past decade, we see again 
a changing ethic perception, so an outsider's perception on the region, where I already said there's this idea how to fill Gondo Badashan in Central Asia as such. So it's not only uh, the mountainous Badashan region, which is um, Badashan Kuhestani, which is somehow uh, in this narrative, but entire Central Asia is often in this idea about geostrategic division of, um, of Eurasia here between, for instance, Russia, the West, uh, and China. And in particular, in, in the past um, years, we see this increasing discourse and increasing perception of China uh, reaching out uh, to the region as, as, as such. And there's a certain idea that now with China's um, One Belt, One Road initiative or the so-called Silk Road 2.0, this space is suddenly filled and Gono Badashan is like so many other places, um, a region of contest and of uh, conflict. Um, conflict of interest here, of influence, there's the question of resources, but I would be very careful to overemphasize it uh, due to, uh, to some extent, the geographic situation and the difficulty to extract resources from there. But also we have seen relatively limited direct investment um, or direct, direct penetration, economic penetration of the region as such, despite a few kind of exchange places as such. Even uh, we saw it, uh, I saw it the last time last week, even the idea of um, Mackinder, that so-called heartland theory of 1904, that it has the context here of the great game of this uh, colonial confrontation between Tsarist Russia and the British Empire in the um, 19th and early 20th century. And last week I saw it in the context, or I reread it in the context of the, of the war in the Ukraine, that there's this idea that, that uh, from a Russian strategic point of view that you have to be in control over this pivot area. And then you have uh, basically um, the, the key to, uh, to rule the entire Eurasian landmass and by this uh, most of the world. I'm very skeptical of this. I would not return to this. And I would be very kind of careful to, to use this kind of um, narratives and discourses again, because this overemphasizes uh, the very kind of geostrategic um, the position of Gondo Badashan as such. However, we have, of course, important trajectories, which also influence local conflict dynamics as such. And there are three elements I would like here to, to stress very briefly. There's, of course, the Western disengagement, which we have seen in particular since 2014. Um, and that is something I worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for a couple of years. Um, mostly in Central Asia, and I followed the German diplomatic and political um, discussions on Central Asia and Afghanistan as well. And what I really have to, like, of course, we need more research on this, but what seems to me very obvious is that for a very long time, Western policymakers, European ones in particular, have, have viewed Central Asia through an exclusively Afghan lens. So when I look at um, politic, political planning in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany, partly also the European Union, Afghan security, stability was um, the most, the, the, had the highest priority and most of the initiatives in Central Asia and Gabao as such as well, were th seen through this lens. And that has changed dramatically, of course, already in 2014 when NATO and most of the European countries said we would need to disengage from Afghanistan and then of course dramatically in 2021, in August 2021, which highlighted to my extent, to my opinion also the, the extreme failure of Western engagement, not only with Afghanistan, but also with uh, Central Asia as such, and in particular here also Tajikistan, where we see also a certain retreat from European countries in their engagement on various levels from security to um, development cooperation. And um, Germany is leading this disengagement with Central Asia, which I unfortunately have to acknowledge here. There's another thing which we have seen to some extent that is the rise or let's say a, a new role of China and a return of Russia into the region. I do not have the time and I'm pretty sure that most of my friends and colleagues here in the Zoom virtual room have, have much more in-depth knowledge on this 
than I do have. But we see um, a transition here that, of course, since basically the early 2000s, we see a much stronger involvement of Russia into local affairs in Central Asia and Tajikistan in particular. But we see also the rise of China. To some extent, this was facilitated already in the late 1990s by the Shanghai Five, where border regions were very important. And the one photo you saw, um, I think two slides before, with this very empty um, 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 mountainous space with a, with a fence there. This fence was the Chinese border, which was to some extent 40 kilometers from the actual geographical border. And uh, this was a part of this negotiation within the Shanghai Five and the later Shanghai Cooperation Organization, how to organize this border region. And that is, for several reasons very important because the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization already in 1995, but then also with its formal establishment in 2002, was an important venue where Beijing could try out multilateral cooperation. Um, not that uh, China never did this before, but China had a certain learning curve, if you want. So it was until 78, um, pretty much isolated. And then we see this uh, reform politics, then Xiaoping and others in, in China. And so China opened up. And China, in my opinion, is still somehow testing and trying out multilateral context, how to act in them. And I think from this perspective, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is an interesting showcase or an interesting case to study and to look how, for instance, China cooperates with the Central Asian neighbors and in particular with Russia, Russia as such. But that, of course, had an uh, important impact on, on, um, on Central Asia and Gabao as a region as well. Well, very often from a Western perspective, the Shanghai Corporation was considered to be a club of dict dictators, um, but nonetheless, it's an interesting um, format of international engagement, which has a regional impact. And um, here, of course, we see now with this um, process that Iran becomes a full member, it will be very interesting for the forthcoming years to see. But importantly, and that is imp important here also for Gono Badakhshan as such, from an emic perspective, so from a Gono Badakhshan perspective, all what happened there is external because the local policymakers, the local communities were never involved in this process. And China is negotiating its uh, expansion, its one belt, one road, its Silk Road 2.0. And importantly, after August uh, 21, so after the withdrawal of the West from Afghanistan, also security, not with the local population in the regions, but with the center, in, in this case, of course, Dushanbe, here a meeting shortly after the um, the withdrawal of from Afghanistan, where the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi um, came to Dushanbe, not only to Dushanbe, to uh, discuss security issues here. And now also in the context of the Ukraine war, we see very clearly on the one hand, China is still somehow exploring its options, but it certainly has an idea um, that it will not um, cooperate here with civil society or with the local population as such. Finally, um, this Silk Road for the local population can easily turn into a nightmare. And this we have seen in different places in Tajikistan already. When I think about um, Sukht, for instance, there was this idea about the Chinese city, which is a massive disaster. But also in Dushanbe, for instance, we have this um, heating facility number two, which has been built by Chinese companies and where we have no idea about the conditions, what kind of contracts were, um, were, were, were basically um, um, he assigned and what kind of obligations the Tajik government has. There's currently the estimation that China holds about 70% of Tajik foreign debt. And that of course gives a lot of, or can uh, um, put a lot of pressure on the Tajik government. And we see that, or at least when I talk to my Tajik friends and colleagues, I see an uneasy, an increasing uneasiness with the Chinese investment and the Chinese influence in the region. Tajikistan, due to the limited connectedness of the civil society and the repressive politics of the Rahman government, of course, we see this not really articulated. But in other parts of Central Asia, when I look at Kyrgyzstan, where I have worked and lived for a very long time, um, I see this much more pronounced in Tajikistan, still somehow always suppressed. And for Gono Badakhshan, it has a kind of very important recent, or not so recent, but 
a, a changing um, kind of trajectory, and that is the establishment of the Chinese base at Chaiman. I'm not talking about uh, the Chinese building a police station or like a, an MVD station somewhere closer to Khorok, but here in the utmost eastern, southeastern part of Badashan, close to the Chinese border, apparently. Um, we, we, we have seen that, that the Chinese military has established a base in 2019, which would completely change also Chinese politics in the region. And here Badashan is the destination of it. And that um, indicates the, 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 the very kind of challenges and changes we see in the region. So far, it seems to be a rather small military um, deployment, which is very likely connected to forms of surveillance and border security. And of course, Chinese um, like um, issues or like this, this kind of um, being a threat of what could happen um, after the, the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan. We can neutrally, we can still state that uh, the United States, the NATO troops, and also the Germans have provided some sort of security also for the Chinese and Russian during their long uh, in engagement in Afghanistan. And that is now, of course, uh, not there anymore. And there's a certain initial security interest by the Chinese, and they are certainly trying out what, what kind of options do they have. And I think the space is a very good indication for this. But we are still talking very much also from a Chinese perspective. I'm here in discussion with some of my, my colleagues from the modern Chinese history department. It's still very much also in Chinese narratives, a peripheral. China is much more concerned with the Pacific and is vesting there much heavier than in, uh, in, in Central Asia or elsewhere. Last but not least, and this is very brief because I think most of my other colleagues um, uh, we'll talk uh, more aptly about this and more knowledgeable about this. It is this local challenge in the regional context. This is a large geographical kind of context, which I gave you with some very basic ideas how to um, um, place Gabao. Very important here for many ethic actors. So those who are not from the region is periphery, is remoteness which is not, of course, the case for the local population. But when we look at the conflicts we are discussing today, it's first of all this question of the kind of central government in uh, Dushanbe, which has adopted over the past years a very aggressive tone uh, when it comes to identity politics in Tajikistan, basically excluding uh, the population, the communities and the Pamir from the very body politics of Tajikistan. This is a, this is, um, a tabloid from, from Khorog, um, I think it was in 2019, uh, which I found on Radio for Europe. Zabone Tajiki, Zabone Suhu Farhangas. So the Tajik language is the, uh, is the language of peace and culture, and all the smaller languages, the Eastern Iranian languages in the Pamir, are not part of it. And that is a very clear indication. And also, if you look at, um, for instance, uh, the population assessments, the Pamirs are not anymore in an ethnic category, which they were in Stalin's times. The first kind of um, 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 assessments or um, uh, population um, counts, uh, the, the Pamiris were, were divided into the different ethnic and language groups. That is not anymore the case. And one of the uneasiness, uh, which is right now, uh, of course, very tangible, is this question where to place um, um, Bono Badashan, Mountain Badashan in the larger, uh, context of Tajik politics, and there we see an increasing, and you have mentioned this already, aggressive politics by the central government, where it's also very much about identity, polit identity politics. And here I, I would say that the, the, the Rahman government has adopted one that is, of course, playing attention here to language as such. But I would say, from my perspective, also as a person who, who does Islamic studies, it's also a kind of very clear idea that the Ismaili community is not part of the general Tajik Muslim community. Um, as such, there's always this idea that the Ismaili community is cosmopolitan and some of these um, um, kind of propaganda from on behalf of the of the government in, in, in Dushanbe sounds to me like in particular the anti-cosmopolitanism campaign uh, reminds me of old Stalinist uh, uh, rhetoric as such. 
But, and that is my final two words I would like to say, we see also certain trajectories which are connected to history. The one in this not really good uh, international crisis report from 2018, which I really thought was not very well researched and perhaps also draw the wrong conclusion. Um, but there's for instance, and we see this already, we mentioned here the civil war, um, and we need to take into consideration that Kono Badakhshan arranged with the Dushanbe government at that time, so this rump government of Rahmon from 92 to 97 on, a separate peace agreement in 95. And from that time on, you had a certain form of additional autonomy. And in this additional autonomy, some um, like alternative networks could arise uh, around this autoritate. Um, so a form of um, a form of informal um, um, networks that are very important and that, in my opinion, are also contributing today to this perception, the uh, ethic perception, not the emic one. And of course, uh, and that has been over the past years almost completely went out of uh, the international uh, perception. Afghanistan is today producing more opium than ever before. You see this with the US ODC report from 2016. When you then look at the uh, at the at the data, uh, what how much opium is produced, and at the end of the day, how peaceful, by and large, the border between Tajikistan and uh, and uh, Afghanistan is, we clearly have to indicate or we have to draw the conclusion that, of course, to some extent trans-border drug trafficking, where on both sides we have elites that benefit from the situation, uh, is, is, is part of contributing to this at least um, relative stability at the border as such. And that is, of course, again, a global phenomenon, because most of the opium is not consumed in Gono Badakhshan or in Tajikistan, but in Russia and the West. And this is my short uh, kind of uh, intervention for this afternoon. I hope I didn't take too much time. And I think we immediately go to um, to so Sophia, yeah? All right, so well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tim, for your outstanding scene setting presentation that really gave us a, a good feel for the different regional trajectories. I want to interject here that um, hopefully the remaining speakers will keep their remarks to 10 minutes because otherwise we'll, we're going to become really tight in terms of time for Q&A. But at the same time, and in a contradictory message, if you could pace yourself for the sake of the interpreter who has to um, turn everything into, into Russian. So he's asking for that as well. Right, so with that, we'll move on to Sophia. Um, thank you very much um, uh, for IVPR for organizing this event and for inviting us. I'm really uh, pleased to be among this esteemed panel of experts to discuss um, the uh, instabilities and the, the, the current situation in Gabao, uh, but also look into, uh, into it more in, in, a, in a sense of a, of a more uh, like historical patterns of uh, violations of human rights uh, in the region um, and how that nexus between human rights violations um, and uh, risk of conflict, risk of instabilities and clash clashes emerges um, in Gabao. Um, for, um, so for, uh, for my analysis, I uh, was drawing back on the existing research uh, around uh, and the interlinkages between human rights violations and, and conflict, um, and then the, the, the link, the nexus between justice and peace, um, which is quite uh, debatable. Um, but in the context of Gobao, um, uh, I think um, that's exactly um, where uh, justice would play as, a, as, a, as a, an important mechanism for peace. Uh, so, you know, research suggests that violations of human rights and uh, the existing of, of, of negative uh, horizontal inequalities uh, increase risk of internal clashes, and that has been uh, researched and that has been scientifically proved. Um, and these violations are primarily um, violations of, of, of civil and political rights um, that trigger um, and, and serve as immediate causes of, of, of clashes. 
Uh, so it, be it um, a case of actual judicial killings, be it a case of enforced disappearance, uh, or other forms of violations of, of civil and political rights. And then and in, in, and together with the existence of negative um, horizontal inequalities, that increases uh, risk of internal uh, clashes. And by horizontal inequalities, um, it uh, often uh, is meant as uh, is, is the inequalities that are perceived as uh, by, by a certain group. And that group can be formed through different identity markers. So whether it's uh, inequalities that are, you know, horizontal inequalities that are um, uh, uh, that are experienced by women as a group or experienced by a certain ethnic group, experienced by a group uh, from a certain region, uh, which uh, uh, population in Gabao falls within that category, also being um, linguistic and religious minority. Um, and, uh, and then with this uh, horizontal inequalities, these are uh, often the you know, violations of, uh, of um, social, economic and cultural rights. Um, and the analysis goes across uh, the, the um, criteria of, of social economic development. And all of that then and together uh, forms collective grievances and a construction of an identity as a group. Um, and then in times when both these two uh, criteria met, uh, meet um, these collective grievances um, and this identity um, of, of, of people, of a group of people being uh, feeling as being discriminated against uh, and being deprived of both uh, their um, economic, social and cultural rights and civil and political rights, um, at times can play as, uh, as uh, and, uh, you know, as, in, in protests, in, in, in uh, nonviolent civil resistance, but uh, also depending on how severe are um, those human rights violations, it can also potentially lead to a more violent clashes. Um, so when we put this all in the, um, in the context of Gabao, um, as we mentioned, the fact that uh, the region has been neglected for quite a long time um, is, is quite vivid when you look into the statistics and specifically the socioeconomic statistics. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, both in the official statistics, but also the um, researches and surveys that have been done lately, whether it's the demographic and health survey, or is it the, is the, the vulnerability and resilience surplus that was done uh, for the first time in Tajikistan, I think in 2019, or the official statistics, you can find uh, these inequalities quite easily. Um, and these negative horizontal inequalities might not always be also attributed to direct discrimination. It, it might be that the, the, the group, and in this case, uh, Gabao started off already with quite um, acute socioeconomic situation and, and being uh, dependent on um, dotations from, uh, from the center uh, back in the Soviet time, uh, and uh, the, the region remained um, underinvested, um, and so that led to the to the fact that the region is now struggling to keep up with the rest of the the the, the regions in, in the country. Um, and it's it's uh, it's not uh, a secret that that it's uh, Gabao has the highest poverty rate uh, in the country. Um, and that's, that's monetary poverty, but then there's another indicator that measures uh, poverty in terms of multidimensional poverty. So it looks into issues like access to drinking water, access to um, uh, food uh, and, and other uh, parameters of poverty. And in this sense, Gabao is also, uh, Gabao's six districts out, uh, out of eight um, are um, having multi-dimensional poverty. So it's above the national average of 64%. Um, then we can go to, the, to the, some of the um, health determinants um, that correlate with the right to health. Um, in, in Gabao, for instance, the, the um, health facility births uh, are at 76%. Um, and in comparison, you can see 99% um, in Seoul region, 97% in Dushanbe. And this is also due to 
um, to the the inaccessibility of, of um, these health facilities uh, or um, the you know not the, the the population specifically women who don't have the necessary financial means uh, to go uh, to the maternity um, to the health facility beds uh, or the physical accessibility as as we know the region is quite big and the there's always this problem of transportation and, and having access to the, um, specifically to Horog to, to give birth. Um, stunting is below 20% in all regions except for Gabao. For Gabao is 32% and it's stunting in children. So they don't get the, um, the necessary nutrition uh, uh, to, to basically to develop. And anemia in children and in women is the highest in Gabao. It, this is also linked to the right to health and linked to the uh, to the fact that uh, population in Gabao is not receiving the necessary nutrition that both women and children need to develop um, uh, properly, especially women in, in during their pregnancy period. Then other determinants are, for instance, uh, the uh, access to drinking water is 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 uh, correlate correlates with the right to adequate standards of living. So half of the population of Horog, the administrative center, does not access does not have access to drinking water, and that becomes problematic also when the region is thinking about um, using tourism as one of the um, one of the ways to to boost the economy. Um, as without access to drinking uh, water, uh, it's quite difficult to also bring tourists to the city. And I'm not speaking about the districts where the situation is even worse. Um, and, and up to 90% of the income of the population goes to the to, to food. Uh, um, and according to the 2020 data, 16,000 people are unemployed in Gabao. And a large number of these unemployed people are young people. Um, from uh, 18 years to, to, to 25, uh, who also constitute the, the category of youth who are neither in employment nor in educational training, which then in turn also um, increases the risk of criminality, it increases the risk of uh, conflicts, clashes when it's not addressed. And then access to information is, is hampered in the region. We all know that the region has been cut off the internet for more than three months now. Um, and this happens uh, quite often whenever there are protests, whenever there's um, a clash in the region. Um, and then there's, there's no independent media in the region. So it's quite difficult to report human rights violations or do a, a regular situation of reporting as well from the region. Um, and then when you see these uh, unequal, uh, th these uh, horizontal inequalities and together with, uh, with direct violations of civil and political rights, they play out as, as clashes. Um, and this is the timeline of the major events that happened since 2012. So we've see, we see here uh, the, the, the situation in 2012 when uh, during the special operation and then events that followed the special operation, 21 civilians were killed um, and uh, several more received injuries of, of, of uh, you know, different degrees. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a direct violation of civil and political rights. Um, and uh, then, then we had protests in Yushkashim in 2013. Um, there were protests in March uh, 2014 in Wushan, which also left uh, one person with severe spinal injuries. Um, there were protests in, in 2018 in Horog. Um, where two citizens were killed uh, and four were injured. And then we had this listen, uh, the, 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 the recent um, uh, instances uh, in uh, December with alleged extrajudicial killing of a, of a, um, of a, a resident in, in of Tavdeim. And then the two uh, deaths that were caused by the excessive uh, use of force during the demonstrations. Um, and we have 17 injured. So with all of these uh, cases, um, there were not a single investigation um, that was done. So basically we see civilians being um, deprived of their lives uh, in a civil time without uh, um, any uh, declaration of any emergency situation or a wartime. 
um, and there are no investigations following. And then on the background of that, we see more and more people, young uh, or more and more young people, primarily men from Gobao, being convicted uh, to certain uh, to, to, to different degrees of of, of imprisonment. Um, and with the last event, we have seen that uh, around 23, I, uh, I have, I've updated the number today, five more people have been caught and criminal cases have been opened against them. So it's 23 now, just linked with the, the, the events uh, that uh, happened um, since December. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, an interesting topic for research. If whoever wants to research around issues on access to justice and incarceration rates, um, that's quite alarming. And because the data is closed, uh, it's not quite uh, um, possible to do the analysis at this point, but I would just flag that out for people to see uh, um, how the situation is, is, is in this um, sphere. So, and then just to sum up in one minute, what can human rights framework then offer for Gobao? Uh, Given that the violations uh, of civil and political rights in Gabao and the horizontal inequalities that we have seen have been um, have not been uh, um, occasionally uh, happening, um, it's it's more uh, they they form more uh, uh, a certain pattern. So we can we can see that this has been happening um, and developing for a decade now. So it's quite difficult to look into this just through this one incident that happened in December and to look at it holistically, looking back to 2012 and across all these years, it's important to establish some form of commission of inquiry or an independent monitoring mission, or some form of truth commission so that um, the trust is built uh, and the population in Gabao uh, restores trust in, 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 in the justice sector, restores trust in the local government, in the central government, um, and is not, uh, is not uh, inclined to use other forms of seeking justice. So the formal justice uh, procedures should be in place and it should be exercised. And then the last but not least is that better access for human rights organization needs to be guaranteed. Um, there are not that many civil society organizations in the region, not, I mean, to my, to my uh, knowledge, very few human rights organizations who also struggle to operate under these conditions. So it's important to link also human rights organizations from Dushanbe and other parts of the country with Gabao and make sure that the situation with human rights violations is being addressed properly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Subia. Uh, before moving on to Bruce, I'd like to ask you, Subia, in your very nicely put together and helpful timeline of unrest, we see that unrest breaks out every few years in Gabao. The government has always had a tenuous hold on the region, based it is, as it has been on informal agreements with informal leaders uh, and a truce of sorts that has fallen apart. So I wanted to ask you, to what degree is the current crackdown on a different scale, in your opinion? Um, well, I think in, you know, the current, uh, the current um, crackdown is not so much on the, the, the so-called informal leadership as it's on the you know, civil society activists on human rights activists on the larger um, ma you know, members of diasporas, leaders in the, in the diasporas outside of Tajikistan. So it's quite serious. Um, and it's, it's uh, this list of people who might potentially face criminal charges keeps uh, growing and growing. Um, and you can see people uh, of, of different background being added to the list, but whether it's those who are engaged in human rights work, or those who are doing you know, sportsmen, uh, people of, of different uh, background and profession are, are being um, subjected to this, uh, to this, uh, you know, risk uh, facing criminal uh, cases. So um, this also then, I think this also impacted how the, um, this um, resistance is, is growing. 
So we see more and more people doing online statements, offline statements, um, and it's the composition of people who are doing it is quite different. We see more women engagement. In fact, more women have been engaged in this um, in this protest in Gabao and outside of it um, as usual. So you can see that this representation and, and is 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 quite diverse now. So eventually, the crackdown would be also on people with quite diverse background. Mm, very interesting. All right, thank you very much. So we'll move on to Bruce now. Okay, thanks. And actually, your question was a good lead in for me there too. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, you, you mentioned that this has been the one part of Tajikistan that since the Civil War, the government hasn't been able to really get firm control over. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to kind of do a very brief uh, kind of history and culture 101 of, of Gorno Badakhshanda, and hopefully that'll uh, help to understand why that's it's so difficult for the Tajik government to get control over this region. It's worth mentioning, of course, that this is this is more than 40% of Tajikistan. When we talk about Gorno Badakhshan, you know, it, it's by some estimates 45%. So nearly half the country is this is this one section in the east, um, and yet there's no more than than 200 220,000 people living there, right? So um, they have their own languages, um, their own cultures, uh, you know, everything, the clothing, the national patterns, everything, all that stuff would have been unique to them as people that were living up in these mountains, as opposed to the people in the lower lands uh, where Dushan Bay is, Hotman, places like that. Um, so, and of course, we've heard that there are Shiite Muslims and, and followers of the Aga Khan. So they also are distinct from the rest of Taj Tajiks by uh, and really Central Asians through that. Um, <clears throat> you know, now, uh, I like Dr. Dr. Epkenhans had, had mentioned that these, these people were, uh, you know, in a remote area. And I think that's, that's a big part of what we got for the, of the problem is that this, this area is remote and has been cut off for, from most of the, you know, the Chinese civilization to the North and the East and, and the civilizations of Central Asia or Afghanistan or India. Uh, just because they are oh, so far up in the mountains. I mean, um, historically, if you had lived in that region and remembering that Marco Polo had heard people live up there. And so we, you know, these people have been living up there. There have been people living up there probably millennia, right? And we, there, we've seen outposts, sure, uh, you know, from 2000 years ago, uh, you know, that are up there. So people have been living there for a long time. They were probably part of empires, Hanits, kingdoms, whatever you want to call it that were drawn on a map that the, but they never even knew that they were part of those kingdoms and the people then the governments that had, had incorporated their territory probably didn't know anything about what was up there anyway to begin with. Um, so the, you know, the first time that foreigners actually enter this area and, and set up a presence uh, would probably be, you know, Tsarist Russia, um, you know, as far as outsiders. And they would have shown up and, and been interested in setting up out, military outposts like the one they have at Morgab that they set up, you know, at the end of the 19th century. Um, and so that's, that's the introduction to foreign culture, you know, and probably in certainly the last thousand years is, is a small group of people showing up with some kind of weapons and saying, you're part of our territory and we need to establish some kind of military post here to keep an, a, watch, a watch on our, what we consider the borders of our kingdom or something. So it also, gives you an idea of what it would be like, you know, the Soviets continued that, but what it would be like for the foreigners viewing this area. This is not a heartland area. It's not an area that they're, they're probably going to develop. They consider it a far outpost in a remote region on the periphery of their borders, right? So it's, you already got this thinking going in there. And, and like I said, the people are different than any of the people of the lowlands that they run into. They would be very familiar with other people in the region that are up there, Kyrgyz, for instance, uh, that wander through the mountains and have that they, they cultivate the same meager kind of crops, they tend the same kind of animals that everyone is used to. Um, so the introduction of Russia into this and later the Soviet Union is really the first time and maybe ever when, when somebody from outside shows up and stays and decides to develop it a little bit and impose uh, for a sustained period of time their view or their governance upon the region. So this is this is something like I said, the people in the region haven't were never used to uh, at all. Um, you know, now all of a sudden they're part of the Soviet Union, everyone has to learn Russian. Um, you know, schools are set up there. 
uh, things that they haven't been seen for electricity, things like that start to come up there too. So th these are all uh, pretty new. Dr. Epkin Hans showed the picture of Gorna Shan 1925 to 2005, 80 years. That gives you an idea. As I said people have been living there for a millennia. That gives you an idea how long this place has been you know, under, under the authority of a government that actually was paying attention to what was going on up there, right? Very, very, this is all very new for the people up there relative to their long history in this region. It's connected, you know, Horog, which we've heard about, is connected by two roads to the outside world, neither of which are reliable during winter months. Uh, there's the road from Dushan Bay. It can be closed. It's been repaired and uh, repaved in some in some areas. There's actually pavement, but in places it's a one lane road. It can be closed up to eight months during the year from landslides and and snow and uh, snowfalls. Um, the Murgab Road is is probably open longer than that, but it's at least the last time I was on it, uh, it was virtually entirely unpaved. Uh, really unpredictable. Uh, you know, this the you could travel maybe, you know, in some parts 25, 30 kilometers an hour, maybe. Um, you know, so th it's not it's not well connected, even though it's been you know more than 100 years since the Russians showed up. Um, it's not very well connected to the outside world. So I jump ahead here a little bit. Um, in the 1970s, the Soviets started to to kind of correct because they want everyone to be a Soviet man, right, um, or a woman. Um, they figured that the way to, to kind of get the Pamiri people in, integrated more into society is to move some of them down into, into Tajik, the Tajik Soviet Republic proper and have them cultivate fields and things like that. And at the same time, exchange people from the lower lands that they send to our ethnic Tajiks uh, up into Gornobotikshan and kind of mix up the population and everything like that. Well, that, you know, that's typical Soviet thinking. They did it with all kinds of different peoples all over the place. Um, but 1991, independence shows up, uh, or in, it's independence. Um, they all, Soviet Union collapses, everyone gets their own independence. Um, you know, and of course, Tajikistan, unfortunately, had major political problems right away and fell into civil war, uh, you know, within six, seven months of the time that they became independent, they were already at civil war. Now, one of the groups that was in the opposition, uh, the United, so-called the United Tajik opposition was Ladi Badakhshan, right? And they represented the interest of the Pamiris, but they were on the side battling the government. So um, unfortunately, it's very unfortunate for the ones that are still had been resettled into the lowlands. They're trying to, they get repressed right away. They're the most obvious targets for everybody down there. They're anti-government. They're, they're distinct ethnically and culturally from the other people around there. Um, so, you know, even from the first days of independence, they've had, they've had a really hard time. Uh, and there was a lot of repression against them. Now, um, <clears throat> the peace, come, peace deal comes, and, and, and again, with the very tenuous connections that there are from the capital to Gorno Badakhshan, it's very difficult to establish control. I didn't mention planes, but of course there is an airport, a rogue, it can accept small planes. But again, mountain weather being what it is, uh, you never know. It could be weeks before you could actually fly something, these kind of planes from Dushan Bay and get up there during the winter months, right? Um, so they, they come to some kind of <clears throat> agreement that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the local informal leaders uh, will be the ones that, um, that are in charge. Uh, we leave them there, but in the meantime, they also serve the government. Th that's probably about the, as good agree an agreement as you're ever going to get. The unfortunate thing for the government in the la over since 1997, certainly and since the turn of this century, is that every now and then they feel the need to try to impose control because it is not totally under government control. And every few years something happens and, and they use the threat of sending in uh, the military for security operation and try to finally get control over that. And every time they do, it upsets everything that happens and it leads to violence up there. Um, you know, there, there, there's been accusations, these local informal leaders are involved in all kinds of crimes. Well, my first reaction to that would be, who in the Tajik government has not been accused of these kind of things anyway? I mean, the Uzbek government when Karima was in used to accuse them of being drug dealers. Uh, you know, and that was, that was the Tajik government, Rahman and his people. Uh, you know, so the local leaders have, have an authority over the people there. It's a poor area, as we've heard. Um, they're able to help local people solve immediate local problems that they need. Uh, are they involved in illegal activities? You know, maybe, uh, I don't know. Uh, I couldn't specifically say, I would say this is not on the level of Colombian drug lords or anything. You don't see that these people have fancy mansions and, and 
you know, fancy automobiles and things like that. Um, they don't seem to be living so much better than the, than everybody else, but they do have authority up there and the government tries to work deals out with them. Um, you know, and usually when one of them does something that crosses the line is in the government's eyes, that's when they try to go up there and, and arrest this person or something. Uh, and it leads to all kinds of problems because they had local supporters don't want this. And, and then, you know, here we are, uh, violence breaking out again. And I know that we're short on time and I don't want to take much time too. So the only thing, I, last thing I would mention is you hear a lot of poverty a lot about poverty. One, I would say that the Tajik government seems to have ceded responsibility for development in Gordo Madashah and to Aga Khan. Uh, they don't invest very much money in the, in the region and they seem to be depending on, on Aga Khan and his foundation to, to do things for that area. Um, but they do have a, the road, the Chinese have paved the road from China that goes through now and goes to Dushan Bay. And one of the things that I know that, that has bothered people in Gorno Badakhshan is that these a lot of these shipments that come in or go back to China are, are something that's connected with members of the Rahman family or his, his friends or something. So they don't they go through duty free. I mean, this should be one area where the government where the local authorities take in some money because of transit fees from these from this shipment between China and Dushan Bay. Uh, but they don't because they're exempted from all these fees and taxes uh, by the government in Dushan Bay which creates another problem for them because they, even though there is a chance to get a little more money, it's taken away from them. And I'll, like I said, I'll leave it with, the, with there because I know we're, we're running short of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, in December, it was suggested by a deputy in the Gabao Representative Assembly that Darvaz and Vanj might secede, citing unrest in Harog as justification. And um, some observers have argued that the breakup of the Gabao region could bring about the termination of the region's autonomous status, which as you pointed out, really exists only on paper as it is. And so I'm just wondering, do you think that the um, termination of the region's autonomy is viewed as the authorities as something that could possibly ease the process of land, of leasing land and granting mining concessions to investors from China, does this hypothesis have, have any merit in your view? You know, well, that's the, obviously it's a problem. And a lot of people in Gorno Badakhshan are worried that if, the, if those two districts do secede, so to speak, and join regular Tajikistan, it'd be the start of the, the uh, disintegration of Gorno Badakhshan and it would fall more under government control. But you raised a good point that I, I did not remember too. Um, you know, again, Dr. Epkenhaus, Hans, um, no, rem, reminded us that China has a heavy influence in there. And, and this is a big problem because China has had a lot of investment in the region and uh, the government can't pay for it. We know that, right? You know, the thermal power plant in Dushan Bay and a, and a bunch of other things, the government simply can't pay for it. Um, so they, they, they're the, so far the only government in Central Asia which has signed over uh, mining concessions as payment for some of this. And those mining concessions are in, to nobody's surprise, uh, mainly Gorno Badakhshan. So, so once again, they're getting ripped off. You know, it, it's, they, they have gold, rare earths, things like that that could be mined if they had the money and resources to develop it, but they don't. And so instead, the government is, is paying off debt for uh, infrastructure projects that China's financed by signing over mining rights to the Chinese. And, and once again, you know, the people in the region get nothing. Yep, yep. So instead of, of increasing autonomy, indeed, they're in the process of, of uh, degrading it even further. Um, so we'll, with that, we'll move over to Parviz. Um, Parviz, the floor is yours. Parviz, uh, I think you're muted. Parviz, could you unmute yourself, please? Parviz. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, I mean, my, my, my sound was uh, uh, switched off. We can, we can hear uh, you now. Thank you. This, this way, I mean. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, my task today is uh, to present a roadmap, uh, a roadmap for, for peaceful recovery uh, from the crisis in uh, Gona Badashan uh, based on international experience. And uh, I just brought some examples, some roadmaps uh, examples from different countries and tried to adapt to the current situation in, uh, in uh, Gona Badashan, which was very difficult uh, task uh, because uh, I can say that uh, due to the government, uh, to the, due to the series of mi serious mistakes of the government, undertaken due to, during the last uh, 10 years, uh, uh, the situation became extremely tense. 
So, I mean, uh, <clears throat> due to the wrong policy implemented by the government, uh, previously uh, region, which was pre previously one of the mo most loyal uh, to the government regions of Tajikistan turned into, it is turning to a most uh, critically minded uh, uh, regions in the, in the Republic. And currently, uh, the situation in Bao is a classic example of uh, a stalemate. In conflict resolution, such a stalemate is often referred to by the chess term Tsuk uh, meaning that when any players move, it uh, leads uh, to a deterioration of the position of the situation. Uh, in, uh, in this particular case, uh, we are talking about the fact, uh, the fact that any wrong a truly thought out action or even an action of the government obviously leads to deterioration of the situation. That's uh, it could be referred to, described as you can make uh, uh, you can uh, make any mistake at the same time you can do nothing either. I mean whatever you you, you should do something, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's very easy to make uh, serious mistakes. And you cannot do anything, uh, nothing. So you should do something because this is a crisis. So the situation in uh, Gubao is also characterized by an extremely low level of mutual trust and an equally high level of social and emotional tensions. In such a statement, even a small incident or a simple misunderstanding can serve as a trigger for a new round of tension and loss of control over the situation, moreover on both sides. Uh, in international peacekeeping practice, uh, measures and actions to overcome the crisis, that is this uh, so referred uh, roadmap, uh, uh, usually divided in two parts or two uh, phases. First of all, the measures of direct or immediate impact the purpose of which is to get out of the stalemate as quickly as possible. When any incident that lead, uh, uh, can lead to an outbreak of, uh, of direct violence. Uh, so the most important thing here is uh, to prevent a new escalation after which a, a peaceful settlement may become impossible for a longer time. So as a rule, at this stage, uh, all main activities are end at reducing the level of social and emotional tension and creation conditions for dialect and negotiations. So this is actually about coming out of uh, sort of a uh, situation after which uh, the reconciliation, the real reconciliation process, process would become possible. Uh, the second stage, this is a long-term measures uh, uh, there are lo long-term measures, uh, the purpose of which is uh, to eliminate uh, the uh, conflict generating factors uh, uh, that serve as a basis for the conflict. As a rule, there are problems uh, of, of social, economic, and cultural nature, uh, such as injustice, unemployment, unequal access to re administrative resources, economic resources, and so on. Uh, in this presentation, as I don't have time, I will concentrate mainly on, on the first stage, uh, meaning that uh, the ways of uh, coming out of uh, the stalemate situation. So the immediate, the most immediate steps to prevent further development, further emergence of the violence. So <clears throat> uh, uh, Talking about the Gornobadashan, the roadmap, the potential roadmap could be described also uh, as a, a two stage approach. Well, the first stage is uh, the, the short term measures, the short term uh, measures approach, uh, which implies that, uh, first of all, uh, as uh, if we judge uh, the, poll, the opinion polls, uh, uh, there is a uh, 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 a de facto martial law uh, situation uh, in the region and Harok for almost four years. And the, uh, according to opinion polls, uh, according to my interviews with different people, 
the signs of martial law in Harok uh, in the region are the main irritant uh, for the population. Uh, and it's understandable because martial law uh, uh, cannot last long. Uh, it is imposed as a rule for a very short period of time in order just to stop open direct violence. And after that, the uh, martial law should be canceled. And uh, uh, this is the process uh, really, uh, and then only after that, the process of normalizing the situation should be started. That is, uh, for instance, the roadblocks uh, should be removed, military and coordinating headquarters like uh, Interagency headquarters, uh, which was created in Gorno Badashan, should transfer their power for civilians, bodies, and local police, which is actually wasn't uh, did not happen in uh, Gorno Badashan uh, because uh, the red blocks remain uh, on the streets since 2018. The interagency headquarter, interagency headquarters created by the government. To coordinate, uh, co to coordinate the activities of uh, power agencies uh, has remained in the main, as uh, the main structure in the region for almost four years. As a result, uh, almost every year uh, in the region uh, 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 begins uh, with the circulation of rumors about the possible new police operation and a series of new arrests. This constantly increased the degree of tension in the society and could not lead uh, for a new, uh, a, a potentially it could lead to, uh, to a new round of conflict. So it is believed in the conflict resolution that such constant tension, a permanent tension is one of the main factors of uh, destabilization. As one of the Israeli uh, experts says, uh, tension is better than uh, the war, but the constant permanent tension could be much worse than the war. In other words, constant tension is traditionally considered as one of the main uh, destabilizing factors in the conflict resolution, which uh, and uh, it should be actually become the main goal of the peaceful intervention. In uh, thinking this. Uh, uh, this point in, in uh, um, we have uh, we can propose the following actions of activities uh, to decrease uh, first of all the social tension and uh, one of the major action one of the most immediate action which should be and uh, expected from the government this is the council the uh, internet blockade and this is one of the simplest, uh, the most immediate effective decisions that the government could undertake, undertake in the current situation, because it's uh, such a measure is, of course, such a measure usually uh, often used by the security forces. Uh, they explain that this is to control the situation and to prevent uh, the rallies. But uh, in the conditions of Harok, uh, uh, where there are only 30,000 people live, this measure is counterproductive, it's ineffective, and uh, does much more just, it just harmed the prestige and the influence of the government in the region. And uh, this is actually just irritates uh, the, city, the, the population and uh, promotes the negative feelings of the majority of the population to the government. And uh, second uh, possible action that should be undertaken by the government, th this is moving away from the system of roadblocks in the city, uh, because it's also a sign of uh, actually martial art, uh, martial uh, uh, state uh, in, the, in, the, in the region, and, uh, mm, which is actually uh, irritates the population a lot. Uh, uh, what should be done, uh, this is also a kind of a spot of uh, contradiction, confrontation between the government and the population, because the government says that if we take uh, the uh, roadblocks, uh, we would lose control over the situation, and the people in general are not going to uh, tolerate anymore the roadblocks in the city. Uh, so. Uh, the potential uh, our, uh, way out proposed by the expert is 
to move to a modern system of control over the uh, uh, security situation, which implies the use of the cameras on the street, as well as uh, to use uh, uh, mobile response uh, teams uh, of police. Uh, uh, according to the surveys, uh, initially the checkpoints were perceived with uh, some kind of understanding, but for, for keeping there for, uh, there in the city for four years, it is too much for the population and emotionally people are not really re ready uh, to tolerate it anymore. Uh, another uh, group of actions that could be, should be undertaken by the government, it's uh, very important. This is the restoring confidence and trust because uh, one of the major problems in the region is the crisis of trust in the authorities, uh, which is actually one of the most, one of the potential factors of the stabilization. Uh, full restoration of trust immediately, it's not impossible, but without the progress in this direction it would be very difficult to promote further negotiation process. And uh, part of the population today, especially the young people, take uh, uh, everything that comes from the authorities with hostility and suspicion. And of course, uh, there should be something I thinking by the government as soon as possible to restore the confidence and trust within the region. And what is uh, suggested by people, by local experts, by the uh, experts in, uh, in uh, security issues, this is uh, also based on the international experience. This is actually to transfer the power uh, in conflict resolution process from the security forces, power agencies to the politicians. Because it's understandable because the reconciliation process, this is a political process. And today we have uh, a situation when everything is controlled by the power agencies and power agencies, they are not prepared for that. The power agencies is, are usually used in the beginning of any conflict just an initial stage, very initial stage to prevent uh, a direct violence. So as soon as a direct violence, the direct violence is stopped, there should be, the power should be moved back to the politicians and politicians should be, should lead uh, the uh, political process, uh, the process of settlement, which is not taking place in, uh, in, in, in Tajikistan in general, in, in Gornobanashan well. itself. And this is a kind of vicious cycle because on one hand, uh, the power agencies, uh, they are power agencies, which is naturally, they use only power and the power creates more problems, mm -hmm. uh, more problems. So uh, it's kind of a mutual aggravation of the, of the conflict from both sides. So what is, uh, uh, what is advised actually to move the settlement process to the politicians and action to, uh, to make some cadre changes as soon as possible to bring to the region's people, to the region people who are trusted and uh, people who would be trusted by the population on one hand and they would be also trusted by the government. And uh, without that would be very difficult to restore the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the trust, uh, the mutual trust in the region and to move further. And there should be also transformation of the interagency headquarters uh, uh, into uh, something else, like uh, to give the power back to the local local government, uh, into pro probably to organize an economic headquarters committee. The main functions of which would be just uh, to move forward, for, forward with the, some social and uh, uh, economic reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, there is also. Uh, uh, one of the major uh, problems today is the pressure uh, 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 used by the government over the pro protest movement. There is always uh, no uh, understanding in this field between the both sides and the power agencies use the pressure and uh, the approach of arrest that cause uh, 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 backlash from the people. And today, I mean, it's, it was already covered, so I'm not go going to talk about that, but today, uh, <clears throat> the, this is one of the major 
problems, uh, major major spot of disagreements between the the protest movement and the government because that pro there are about 16 people arrested after the last meetings and people demand actually to revise their uh, cases. So what could be done done by the government is to announce uh, the renewal of uh, the official investigation uh, into the murder of uh, Gulbuddin Ziyabekov and other 16, and to renew the review also the cases, the criminal cases related to, to the recent events in Harok. Yeah. It would restore uh, the, uh, the population of create some basis for the further uh, peaceful settlement in the region. And without that, it would be very difficult to move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Padavis. Um The authorities have initiated provocations with the intent to launch a major security crackdown in Gabao. So the question naturally arises, is Rahman's government even up for negotiation? In other words, is a roadmap for a peaceful recovery, as you have outlined, even a consideration for the authorities or are they simply hell-bent on fully subsuming Gabao once and for all? In my understanding, uh, the government would like to find a settlement. Uh, the government is extremely concerned, especially in the light of the current situation in Afghanistan, in the light of what is going on on the tajik kyrgyz border, in the light of what is going on in Russia. And we're expecting coming, uh, a, 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 a huge number of migrants coming back to Tajikistan. Uh, especially to Gorna Badashan, where the level of unemployment is extremely high. So it's uh, so the government understands that it's extremely uh, difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, probably this is also the lack of uh, information within the government. They don't have enough reporting. Probably uh, this is uh, an old mentality of uh, solving conflict because, you know, during the 90s, the government preferred to use uh, syllabics, meaning the power agencies, um, to uh, resolve conflict with the field commanders. Uh, it was successful at, the at that time, but today the government, in Gornabadashan, the government deals not with the uh, field commanders and not even uh, uh, informal leaders mainly, but uh, with a considerable part of the population, which is totally different, the different case. And the government mentally, I suppose mentally, is not prepared uh, to, uh, is not prepared for, uh, to accept new approaches. And new approaches is needed because the uh, previous methodology is not working. Mm -hmm. so the whole policy should be changed. But mm -hmm. how to do that, I believe the government doesn't know. And the government doesn't listen to other alternative uh, points of view. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a question here from Marat Madashoyev. Uh, and Parviz, given that you've been talking about the need for politicians to lead the process, to move over to that, his question is, do you think local elections can improve the situation in the region? And how realistic is it to carry out such an administrative reform in Tajikistan, where the authorities do not like to share their powers with the public? Yeah, but this is not only the case of Gordon Badashan, but the case in, in Tajikistan. In general, if we talk about the Gordon Badashan, the Gordon Badashan has the same problems as uh, the other regions of the Republic. Uh, but uh, probably, I mean, the protest movement is much higher, much more active because of uh, some objective and subjective uh, reasons. Uh, so I, I believe that. Uh, uh, the election could solve the problem, of course, but I don't think that the government would be ready for that. Mm -hmm. What we can expect from the government to select at least some people who would be trusted by the, by uh, at least by the protest movement in the, within uh, with, with, in Harok. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, like, uh, for instance, the previous governor uh, uh, Faisov, who was trusted by a considerable part of people, so there were high expectation of the people. He was extremely popular, not only in Gordon Badashan. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he was dismissed. And after the, his dismissal, uh, the new crisis started. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even about the personality. Uh, this is about the trust. 
So the, I mean, what we have now is this actually the failed expectations and the failed expectations. This is also usually one of the conflict generating uh, problems or uh, factors. Mm -hmm. I understand. Do any of our other panelists, would you like to weigh in on that question with regard to local elections? Okay, well, then we're going to move on uh, to a question with regard to migration. And uh, the question is, there's a huge mass of migration from Gabao region to Russia. What would be the best solution to stop it? And how can human rights enable citizens to stay in the region? Do you mean uh, from Golden Balashan to, to Russia? To Russia, that's right. Uh, I think that uh, it would be difficult to stop, uh, uh, first of all, because uh, people uh, uh, don't have uh, job opportunities inside the country. It's not only about Badashan, uh, but uh, the whole process is not, not stoppable. Uh, although, although we have now coming uh, out uh, from the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, what we expect, as I mentioned before, this is uh, a range of very negative uh, uh, outcomes. And first of all, the return of considerable number of uh, uh, Tajik migrants back uh, to their country and to potentially undermine the uh, uh, social and economic uh, stability within the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we already will likely be seeing the return of a number of labor migrants to the country given the current uh, crisis in Ukraine. And this is something, a question that I'd like to, to, to pose to the panelists. Um, so the ruble devaluation and the further devaluation of Tajikistan's cur currency, coupled with problems for labor migrants and GDP losses, uh, this could signify that Dushanbe will be otherwise occupied and therefore pay less attention to enforcing the crackdown now underway in Gabao. Or to the contrary, do you think that Gabao regional officials will use Dushanbe's distraction with the above mentioned problems to carry out an even harsher clampdown? perhaps recognizing the international community will not be watching given its distraction with the war in, in Ukraine. And I, I wondered uh, if I, Bruce or Sophia, Tim, would any of you like to come in on that? Tim, I see you have your hands up. Yeah, uh, it was it's both questions like the previous one uh, related to, to migration. I would completely agree with Parvis and would perhaps add what we need to focus on that perhaps is the facilitation of migration, that it goes along a certain set of rules. And, and uh, I think there we have seen many deficits. But what you have addressed right now, I think that is um, a, a clear and present danger that, that in the current situation, the Tajik regime might uh, decide to use the fog of war in Ukraine to implement harsher restrictions on the communities in uh, mountainous Badakhshan. And we should one thing not forget, um, also due to like also due to the ability of the of the government in Dushanbe to tap into international security assistance. Um, the Americans, the Europeans, I mean many, not only the, the Russians and Chinese. I had uh, the impression that um, Dushanbe was able to increase its capacity in in particular in, in the military, not in the hard military sense, not in the sense of a kind of um, um, trans-border conflict, but uh, what, what also Pavis um, hinted at, in their ability to crack down on in an asymmetric way on, 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 on civilian population has increased significantly over the past decade, roughly. Uh, and, and that is, in my opinion, a real danger that they would use this uh, situation to, I mean, to basically crack down on, 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 on the remaining uh, civil society actors, but also these informal authorities. And also by looking at how China reacts now to the crisis or to the war in the Ukraine, we see very clearly that China said, oh, it's, it's an internal issue, it's something far away. Um, I could imagine that Rahman even gets a kind of green light from, from the Chinese government to like implement what he will consider as control over Gola Badakhshan. And the Chinese will say, oh yeah, we need stability there. Um, and I, I always like 
I was always very critical of the Western approach of engagement and of like identifying common interest of the Tajik um, dominating elite in Dushanbe and like inter international ideas of, of security and security cooperation. I think that was from the very beginning flawed and we see this today very clearly. And I'm afraid that Dushanbe will use its increased capacity to crack down on, on civilians in a way we um, should have anticipated earlier. Thank you. So, uh, Bruce or Supia, would you like to weigh in, in on this? Do you think that the, there is the chance that authorities will use the current war in Ukraine to crack down even further in Gabal? Um, well, I think um, we have seen the situation uh, escalating. We've seen uh, uh, five more young people have been arrested today. Um, including one from the one member of the joint commission from civil society. So uh, the, the group 44, which was there up to negotiate between the government and the pro protesters. Um, so I've seen that we, we see that uh, it doesn't seem to be that the government is trying to resolve it through other means. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, how the migration flow would affect, um, there's a huge number of uh, Gabao residents in, in, in Russia. And uh, um, they, the migration from Gabao is, is, as in many other regions of Tajikistan, is due to the economic problems, but also the, uh, the, the more of the security and the crackdown and the tight control over even movements uh, during the nights or the evenings of, of specifically men, young men in Horog and, and other parts of, of Gabao have made it quite unbearable, I think, for, uh, for them to um, leave in Gabao. So lots of them left also because of that, because there's no rule of law, there's quite tight security control and you're leaving um, in a situation when you feel like you're under martial law. So uh, coming back, uh, these migrants, you know, if the, the number of um, young men increases, that potentially will lead to some form of clash if uh, the government resorts to force. And then just if, um, shortly on what Tim has mentioned on the security assistance, this has been a concern for civil society from Gabao and outside uh, since 2012. I think the, 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 the development partners, the, the foreign aid, which specifically uh, focuses on funding uh, security and law enforcement agencies needs to start thinking about how these specific members of the security forces or um, bodies are engaged in human rights violations and need to put on some, uh, put in some vetting procedures before funding it, you know, bringing the flows of the funding without having this accountability processes. Mm. Thank you, Subhiga. Well, we're into our final moments here. And so I wondered if Bruce and Parviz wanted to weigh in on any of these, the recent questions that we've just been discussing. Yeah, if I could just jump in real fast, then I, I would mention that one, um, you could, if about launching a security operation in Gorda Bagashan, you know, to date since independence, they haven't been able to pull it off, right? I mean, they've, they've done it, but it hasn't given the results that they they want. So I don't, I don't see any point in that. And two, and Parviz mentioned the Kyrgyz Tajik border. This should be something that's much more pressing to the government. I mean, today a Tajik border guard and a civilian were killed, uh, you know, in a shootout with, with Kyrgyz border guards. Um, you know, and, and so that that is a pressing problem that needs to be addressed. And, and another problem on the border, just a little bit further west in Gorno is the Tajik government has not been on good terms with the Taliban. And they've said repeatedly in Dushanbe that there's thousands of militants, uh, some of them from uh, Jamayat Ansarullah, which of course is a, a movement, a militant movement from Tajikistan, are in that area too. So, um, you know, it seems to me like that enough problems right now on their borders, uh, both north and south, that launching a security operation in Gorda Badakhshan uh, on the hope of uh, getting some control over the region uh, is, is a, a risk that they certainly shouldn't be taking because they have much more pressing concerns at the moment on their borders. Mm. Thank you, Bruce. And part of these, we'll, we'll give the, the final rem closing remarks to you. I just would like to stress that uh, <clears throat> uh, we are at the edge of big changes in the region 
and uh, there would be some new challenges and some new situations we still have to uh, apprehend. Uh, we are not ready really uh, to apprehend fully what is going on uh, and what would be uh, what would be upcoming soon uh, in the region and, and a set of new challenges. I think that the government, at least the government should understand that uh, the restrictive policy would be not enough. And there would be some need for some new approaches, new uh, new methodology use, uh, and some really comprehensive reforms. Mm. All right. Well, thank you. Well, on that note, we've already gone we've already gone over. But uh, I'd like to thank the panelists once again for their insights. It's been a pleasure again to work with IWPR. We really appreciate the way you all shared your thoughts and ideas. We look forward to keeping in touch and continuing the dialogue and goodbye for now. <laughs>